man you know that intro countdown is a bummer after our intro music man i was pumped after our intro music and then you had that i know and then the I, I almost got countdown. lulled to sleep reverse. there that's right <laughs> we definitely need to reverse it you know i realized jason that we can't see each other during the intro we have this nice little no. back room green room thing going on and then the intro starts and i can't see you and there will be a day that i do a full costume change in that intro <laughs> in, the th in the 30 seconds that'd in be fantastic seconds, we had like, i will do a, a full costume change and shout out for jeff malik for doing the full costume change on our last episode uh but during that 30 seconds, I'm, I'm, I was just thinking Jack's probably actually secretly recording us somehow because I start like dancing and rapping during our <laughs> intro music. So that's what's we'll, cool. I'm we'll like, I'm glad whole, you can't see whole, me. A whole bloopers reel of what happens during the intro. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. You are tuned into Pirates of Finance on Blockworks. That man there. Oh, I got it right on the first try with the point is my good man, Jason Buck. My name is Corey Hofstein. We are the hosts of the show, the man behind the scenes, pulling the strings, making sure everything is operational or at least semi-operational, is Jack Farley. Today, we're going back to the format of Jack's going to ask us questions. Jason and I have no idea what the questions are, and you're going to get our hot takes. Before we do that, though, I do have a question for Jason. Jason, <laughs> I'm noticing, I'm noticing the wonderful Pirates of Finance logo behind you which means you're yep. home. And I'm realizing I don't, I want to know how long it's been since you've been home. Cause let me count correctly. You, I believe went to Miami for F1. Then you came here to Cayman for a week. You then went to permissionless. You then went to Chicago to meet with business partners and you just went to Las Vegas for EQ derivatives. That's like you were gone a month and I saw what you packed. When you got off the plane and came in, <laughs> you had a duffel that maybe had three t-shirts in it. I don't know how you do it. Uh, so the one thing you missed is as you nailed it is it's been a little over the month. And uh, my first stop was in Charleston for my brother's wedding. So before That's I right. even did F1 in Miami. And uh, yeah, as, as I've been telling you for the longest that I all, all of my worldly possessions could fit in two carry on bags. And you never believe me until you saw you picked me up at the airport and came in. And then I was just like showing you all my outfit changes throughout the week. You're like, wait, that fits? And not only was I fitting all my clothes, I also fit my mic, my lights, my camera, like everything. Yeah, that I was can... that was the astounding part that made me assume you had a Mary Poppins bag. Was that the lights and camera and mic came out of the bag as well as your clothing? And this was not like a massive like carry-on bag that really should be a checked bag. No. Like this was like a small duffel. Yeah. It's very impressive. Yeah. Well, uh, one day I, we're gonna have to do a full walkthrough of your entire, I mean, everything you own, I guess. That's great. We yeah, like almost like everyday carry or how you pack. I also, uh, I, I can, I can go into great detail about this. One everybody always asks, and I say, uh, New Zealand merino wool is a lifesaver. Um, you don't need a lot of clothing if it's New Zealand merino wool because it's like anti stink, antimicrobial, antibacterial. I also fold in a bundle, so we can talk about rolling versus bundling. I prefer a bundle. I'm, I'm, I'm an expert at the bundle. Uh, but besides that, by the way, I also want to give a shout out to our comment section. Always fantastic. The comment section was going before we even started. And they're talking about vinyl records. Like it's just, uh, I, I put up our comment section versus anybody's. Um, uh, but speaking of travel and everything, I'm wondering, are you going to, re you know, get some of your pirate privileges revoked? Cause you're about to leave the Cayman islands. What on Monday? Yeah. Tuesday, Tuesday. And I'm done for good. Done with Tortuga. Yeah, I don't know what I'm going to do here. I mean, I guess I'm going, I'm going to another water spot. I'll be uh, on the water outside of Boston, and then uh, I'll be in. I don't know where I'm going after that. Wherever my wife tells me I'm going. By the way, for those tuning in, this is a finance show. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to the finance eventually. I read in the comments that people love the banter, so we decided to extend <laughs> the banter section. <laughs> my one of my favorite ones from last week i've never got uh this one before is that we talk way too slow and i was like wow no that's I've just never me. That wasn't, that one that in my that definitely life. wasn't yeah. you <laughs> that was that was related to me okay but really quickly before we get into jack's questions i do want to know and this is finance related finance adjacent what now that people are going back to conferences eq derivatives in vegas what were people wearing Oh, you know, dude, you're setting me up because I was texting you. It was 99.9% .9 dark suits. And I was like, come on, guys. Like, we've been on the, like, I thought that, like, the, the COVID would break us. You know, actually, I was talking to our, our, our mutual friend, Ben Eifert, just about, 
COVID in general and Zoom culture and how he he's made it to me a dent in the universe for normalizing, like raising a family and, you know, running a highly sophisticated options trading firm, you know, and, yeah, and but like but, Zoom calls with a baby in the arm and he's coding <laughs> on his other laptop. Yeah. So I, I was giving a shout, ben, a shout out to Ben for that. But, you know, so part of that change, I thought we would uh, change kind of suit culture a little bit. And like it was ninety nine point nine percent dark suits. Shout out to Chris City, although he at least came with the light gray. So there was a there was a little bit of variance there. Uh, you you know me, shoes no he wore in, in the picture he posted on Twitter for his award ceremony. If it was the same shoes, this is going to make me even happier because it was tearing up his ankles. He was like losing all the skin on his ankles. So he went he went for him over function and he was actually in a lot of pain while he was doing his presentation. Were they the, the spiked loafers? Oh, he didn't have spiked ones, but he had he had loafers on no socks and his ankle was just tore up. Yeah, that'll happen when you when you don't dress formally for years on end, and then you try to wear dress shoes again. I'm not looking forward to it. Yeah, all my all my suits are packed away. I have one suit that I've been wearing to every occasion over the last two years, which includes uh, conferences, weddings, and funerals. You got to have that that multi dimensional suit. But I'm about to go to a conference in June. That's a four day conference, and I have one suit. I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to pull this off. You're fine. What do you mean? How is he, you wear the same thing every day? Yeah, it's a great look. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what are you wear? let's get to drink three white shirts. You'll be fine. Let's, this All isn't right, a yeah, fashion podcast. We can talk about that later. Hey guys, how's it going? You got a fashion question for us? <laughs> uh, well, first of all, I want to say I did notice uh, that caller. Chris Sidiel was looking really fly on Twitter, and I did notice that he was not wearing socks. So. I, it's interesting and kind of funny to hear that his shoes were uh, were hurting. I also want to say that you know, as chief, uh, sort of as the content you know strategy person uh, for this podcast, I've determined that yeah, the chat loves the banter so much that we should probably just extend it. <laughs> Pure banter. Pure banter. Um, okay, here's the question: Are Rolexes a good inflation hedge? What do you make of the sell-off in Rolexes? as well as the sell-off in NFTs, such as uh, uh, board, uh, board, board Apes, is the risk premium for collectibles, virtual and real, compressing? Jesus, that's quite the deep. Man, you really worked on yeah. that question. Ooh. And he got everyone's favorite topic in NFTs. Yeah, he couldn't, wanna... he couldn't. I thought he was going to stop with Rolexes, but he had to get the NFTs and collectibles in there. I mean, you want to start with the Rolex side here, Jason? And I can only yeah. speak sort of to what I've heard about that space yeah. and some of the prices I've seen. And obviously, pricing is always tough to get because you're talking about a fairly liquid market when you talk about, and to use the phrase, lower-end Rolexes feels kind of silly, but lower-end Rolexes, yeah. like the stuff that moves a lot, like Submariners, you, I think you can get pretty up-to-date prices on something like uh, Chrono 24, or even just going to like Watchbox and getting their listed prices. The higher end stuff obviously is, it's OTC, right? You sort of get the quotes. I think what we've seen is the whole market is softening. And what I have been hearing, and I, Roman Scharf does a great YouTube channel talking all about watches. One of the big conversations was that you had a huge number of gray market dealers enter the space. These are people who are buying uh from authorized dealers or buying from each other, selling to retail, flipping among each other. And one of sort of the things that kept Rolex prices high in the States was a constant bid from Asia, uh, specifically China. So you didn't really ever have to lower your price beyond a certain level because you knew worst case, you could always sell to China. With the COVID lockdowns in China, that bid has disappeared. And you've had a lot of uh, lack of demand in the U.S. So all of a sudden you have a lot of young dealers who have an oversupply of Rolexes that were just sort of flipping amongst each other, no longer having the demand and prices are starting to come down pretty quickly. Now that China's reopening, it'll be hard to say what happens in the watch space. Like these luxury goods, higher end luxury goods trade in their own sort of unique atmosphere. Lower end luxury goods can definitely get dragged down from economic slowdowns. And the data in China sort of suggests that they're having a period of a pretty significant economic slowdown. So, yeah, I think you could see some definite softening in watch prices now that crypto is sort of in the tank. Uh, meme stocks aren't doing great, though. I did notice that GME is outperforming the S&P this year. So yeah. long, 
long meme short equity is I guess is still playing, but yeah, for the most part, right. Um, the money has dried up and, and with it, some of the demand. Yeah. I think that you and I both like tangentially follow like Roman Sharf, luxury bizarre, or even like CRM or time piece trading out of Miami on like their YouTube channels. And it has been interesting and in, uh, Jack's got a good chart here, but like that's what uh, we found anecdotally. And I was saying that on one of the, our previous episodes is that I remember like CRM was just showing on one of their episodes, like just taking all calls and going no bid. They're like, we're not buying anything right now. They just totally are buying. And then like, as you referenced is the opacities, it's literally called the gray market. So it's always like, you know, what somebody else is willing to pay. And so, yeah, we've seen that rollover. But then if we tie this to inflation, this is always interesting. And I can maybe bring it back to the EQD conference too. It's like, correlations are a time window analysis so it really depends on what correlations you're using and like so one could actually argue that the watches were front running inflation but i don't think that's that that it at all like as, as we know with everything it's the price you pay and so we had an enormous bull market <laughs> in physical watches coming out of the start of the pandemic which was i think probably surprising to everyone and so you already had that bull market before we started getting like inflation prints so was that front running or is it once again the price you pay so then when we go start going into inflation environments, the historical analysis would tell you to buy real assets. So then people would go, well, maybe you know, luxury goods like watches are a real asset. But if the price was already bid, you know, three to five X, which you were pre-pandemic, is that going to be the inflation hedge you're looking for? It's not very likely. So it's it's just like we're seeing even in in volatility space right now with fixed strike ball being so high or skew being so high, it's the price you pay. So you won't get that necessarily like convexity in a sell-off. So everything is always the price you pay is like whether it's a good idea or not. And I always think about, you know, people go, well, I know a good hedge for the next crash. It's like defensive stocks. I'm like, well, it's just, this is a Keynesian beauty, beauty contest because if everybody starts buying defensive stocks, well, then they're not going to the, provide the return you get because everybody's front running each other. Well, so I will. Say that, is, that is no, no, no. It's funny you were mentioning defensive stocks because I was just reading a note this morning from JP Morgan that was showing that relative value of defensive stocks versus cyclicals are like, near all-time highs again that, that doesn't mean defensive stocks can't get more bid but in terms of are they cheap it's hard to say they're relatively cheap compared to their cyclical peers but again this is an inflationary period the historical data set doesn't really contain inflationary periods I'll also point out that that graph jack brought up the recent dip in rolex prices first we'd have to ask how that graph is constructed um, yeah. i don't think we're seeing the same dip in like submariners as we are in like super weird Daytonas. Um, yeah. But that said, like, let's look at that big exponential growth in price first and recognize that we've, we've got a pretty natural pullback here. There, you're seeing the same thing in NFTs. If you look at top projects, yes, Bored Apes and CryptoPunks are way down, but they're still, as far as I can tell, up from six months ago, right? So what you really had was like especially... Um, in the NFT market, this massive pump in March and I think maybe mid-April. And then the space really started to collapse. So mutant apes, for example, uh, were trading around 6 ETH in November. They went up to about 20 ETH in January, February, went up to 40 ETH in April and are now back to trading around 20 ETH. So Again, it depends on your horizon when you happen to buy into these different spaces. But I, I really like your point about that lead lag relationship, though. Like people talk about this with gold a lot. Like when, yeah. when is gold an inflation hedge? And ultimately, a lot of this comes down to supply and demand of these assets. And when does that supply and demand get realized relative to when, when that inflation is realized? Yeah, or, and once again, it's gold is a collectible technically too. So we're talking we're talking about collectibles, but also it's it's interesting when we're talking about collectibles for inflation because they previously worked. And I I pointed out what what my great fear is sometimes with like collectibles as we're seeing with wine now, as it becomes fractionalized and easier to buy, and then they show a historical back test of a hundred years of wine. Well, you just change the market dynamically. Like that was the whole point of wine is there were it was hard to to find wine. You had to store it. It was uh, just a very opaque market. As soon as you shed light on that market and anybody can buy in any granular nature, you're dynamically changing that market. So it, the historical back test might as well go out the window. The same, I think, is said, you know, when they talk about real assets with inflation, you know, I always think everybody's like, well, real estate, 
and then like whether that's single family houses or commercial real estate, whether it's income producing or not, they're like, well, you know, like a multifamily property could keep up with inflation. But as you know, I've been talking about, I was like, maybe unless it was uh, during a, a 40 year bull market and cap rate compression. And then you have a rising rates environment, which people can actually hedge. But one of the things they're not thinking about is uh, price controls, capital controls, you know, financial repression, whatever you want to call it, is like if they put a cap on your rent, once again, lead lag. First of all, that rent was reset on a 12 month basis. So it's trailing inflation. But let's say they, uh, lo your local municipality puts on rent controls. Well, now there's nothing you can do about it. And you made your entire bet on inflation with real assets and real estate. And it might be, I'm not saying it's a good or bad bet because you just don't know. Is that That's kind of the point is like, what we're really saying is the historical analogs may not set a precedent. And then whether that interim analog is only a few months to a few years with like say Rolexes, fine watches, or even collectible NFTs, um, what it was interesting because we're talking about correlations though uh eric peters from one river he said on the crypto panel at eqd that he believes uh correlation has got to be dynamic so all you've heard from people raging since march 2020 is that the correlations got closer and closer to one between crypto and and the broader markets um but he's saying you know just like you and i talk about time window analysis is in the future those correlations could be changing and it could go from correlated to uncorrelated to negatively correlated and back again but he he views that we're going to see dynamic correlations going forward but remember you know everybody's always talking their book yeah i mean i think unless there are real economic drivers for fundamental cash flow that would justify why correlations should be structural they probably are going to be dynamic right right now we seem to be in a period of high correlation between crypto and other risk assets because we've predominantly been in a more risk averse environment some people might argue that these are high duration assets and as interest rates rise or real we have have an increase in real rates uh that they should be discounted or deserve lower premia you can you can make that argument i would just argue i think it's easier from a risk aversion perspective um why why we would be seeing higher correlation today, but that doesn't mean we'll necessarily see higher correlation tomorrow for something like crypto, which is a much more sentiment driven asset class right now. There's still not a tremendous amount of real cash flow coming out of crypto. So my long story short take, by the way, because we're way over on this question, are oh, Rolexes the main question inflation today. hedge? Oh yeah, we could go on if we want, Jack. Yeah. But my my main take are Rolex is an inflation hedge. No, I don't believe any collectibles are an inflation hedge. Well, and, and to, I want to point out two things you said before we move on to the next question. One is this is why I hate people using correlation matrices and correlations is because correlations are really hard, and it depends on what you're using. Like you said, unless it's a structural asset class correlation that holds up over time, you know, correlations are just kind of whatever time window analysis and whatever whims of market. So it's really hard to nail anything down on a cross correlation basis. Um, and then, yeah, with the, the only other, and I'm now trying to probably blank Oh, and collectibles, like I was saying with like the wine markets or real estate, or whatever, and people using a, a long historical back test, I always wonder too, is like, you know, as we fr fractionalize and financialize these markets, part of the back test is just buy and hold. And then you're marking the model like PE. So you say like collectibles have, you know, maybe lower, uh, lower volatility or lower drawdowns because historically the rich people weren't selling these into sell-offs. And so what happens in the future if people need cash in a VAR event and they start selling collectibles into a sell-off? Like that yeah. can change pretty dramatically and quickly. By the way, a lot of these collectible indices are also like the same like NFTs. They're floor prices of asks. Right. They're not bids. <laughs> Right. Exactly. <laughs> and that's that's worth noting. This isn't necessarily where transact reported transactions are happening. All right, Jack. Um yeah, so just real quick, Jason, you said something about how like wealthy people owning a certain thing, that means it won't go down as much. I had a similar thesis about Snowflake. I'm like, you know, Snowflake will likely it won't go down as much as Nvidia or Shopify because it's owned like forty percent by this trust of you know, like all these you know, billionaires from uh, from uh, San Francisco, and I'm glad that I didn't act on that because I was wrong. It went down like 60 percent, just like everything else. Um, okay, our next question is: As viewers of Pirates of Finance know, risk parity is pretty much just levered stocks, bonds, and nothing else. <laughs> what, if anything, is the significance that bonds, at last, have been rallying on days that stocks sell off hard? Jack had to get that one in there, didn't he? Do you want me to start while you collect yourself too? It's like this is what I'm saying about. I said I wasn't going to get mad. I said I wasn't going to yeah. get mad. <laughs> you said on Twitter you weren't going to get mad. So this once again, this goes down to correlations, right? And you know, if we saw like a forty, 
what stretch of correlations are you looking at? You look at one day correlations, one week, one month, 10 years, like it, 100 years, it doesn't matter. And like, that's what we've seen, like negative correlation for stocks and bonds over the last 20 plus years. And then we started seeing them get correlated. And a lot of people say that correlation is with inflation or real rates when they become correlated. But yeah, in the last week to this month, we've seen, you know, when stock sell offs, you've seen, you know, bonds pick back up. So you're seeing that negative correlation again. And, you know, is that due to the massive sell off in the worst bond market since 1842? And these are dead cat bounces or bonds coming back? I don't know. I wonder if Corey will give a hot take on that. Yeah, I've got no good answer here other than. Right. Again, what are the structural effects that are happening in the market? I think what you saw was we got uh, clarity around moving from quantitative easing to quantitative tightening. And so the market front runs that, right? The market's always trying to look forward and, and front run to reprice. We got increasing clarity around the number of rate hikes, at least from a policy discussion perspective. I think recently central banks have been a little bit more dovish than most people seem to expect given the inflation numbers that we've seen. So yeah, I mean, again, am I trying to figure out what's happened in the last week? No, a lot of this stuff is just flow related. You might be able to make arguments that we might see the exact opposite happen in a couple of days because, you know, I might get pensions rebalancing into stocks and selling bonds. Who knows? This stuff is always hard to figure out from a, a month-end flow perspective, from a you know, uh, from a response to economic policy perspective. I think if we look over the last six to twelve months, there's a natural picture that can be painted as to why bonds did what they did. But at this point, given what central banks are saying about the pace at which they're planning on hiking, I'm not sure. Uh, given current like long-term inflation expectations still being around, I don't know, two and a half, three, three and a half percent to spend, depending on where you are. I'm not sure the 10 year being at three is necessarily the the wrong rate. Yeah, it's going to be really, well, one thing I wanted to point out that you put on is, uh, you know, we have actually been talking about the show a bunch of times. It's like, uh, at forward expectations for rate hikes, you know, like everybody has given the forward expectation. We're like, this is going to change dramatically. And I think the latest one now is what 50 in June, 50 in July. And so that was different from, you know, eight rate hikes going out. So once again, these things change. And if we get a massive market sell off, it's going to change pretty dramatically. And, and as we see allegedly like housing, unemployment, all these numbers starting to roll over used car prices, you know, are they going to then start slowing even earlier? Nobody really knows, but like, that's, that's the thing where that we're looking at is, are they potentially killing markets? And then I was going to ask you, cause you, you track it even more than I do. Yeah. It's like you were is like our pension funds rebalancing our target date uh, funds rebalancing is that end of quarter coming, you know, like all, you know, intra month is a bit different. So it'll be, it'll be interesting to see, you know, where these larger, um, non-economic or, or I shouldn't say non-economic, but like just deterministic rebalancing behaviors are going to affect markets. It was interesting, even on the, the panel that you could you talking with the insurance panel is there saying, you know, we have 30 year time horizons and, you know, a quarter or two is not going to affect the way we, we hedge or change our portfolios. But I do wonder over like a you know multiple quarter cycle, especially even with like target date or younger people in their four hundred one ks, is like you we move from sixty forty to like seventy thirty to eighty twenty. You know, does that start moving back again now that we're starting to see some some actual interest can be gained on on the treasury side? Yeah, I mean, you on the CTA side, uh, trend followers, right? Managed futures strategies that that look at trends in these asset classes and can go long and short have predominantly been short bonds for the last six to probably nine months, yeah. depending on the speed of the trends. Those are all pretty much asymmetrically on the same side of the trade. They could become systematic buyers if you get a little bit more positive performance as those trends sort of, as, as bonds sort of maybe find a bottom, those trends turn to neutral and then potentially even positive. And then all of a sudden you've got a lot of flow going into bonds. The other side of that, and, and Jack brought it up, is risk parity. If you start to see equity volatility go down and commodity mm -hmm. volatility decline, then risk parity is going to increase its leverage and become a buyer of bonds as well, right? So there are dynamics here at play that aren't necessarily economic in nature as to why someone might be buying or selling bonds that could be driving some of the short-term performance. In the long, in, in sort of my view, just like to put it all out there, in the long run, I, I 
believe it's all fundamentals and economics that are at play day to day. I, I think it's all flow. And a lot of that flow, I might buy or sell in my own fund having nothing to do with my view of the market. It might have to do with inflow and outflow of my fund. And just because I'm selling doesn't mean I'm bearish. I'm selling because maybe a client redeemed some money. Or I might not, I might be buying and I might not even be bullish, but a client gave me money to put to work. So there are there are things to consider that where's the money coming from? Who has to do something with the money? What are the systematic rules? I think a lot of that's driving the day to day much more than, you know, uh, the fundamentals are necessarily. Well, and as you know, like I, you and I talked about this was on our, our quarterly review podcast for our funds. I was like, I'm going to annoy everybody on this call. I was like, I'm so happy we're rebalancing and buying bonds. Like it taking from our winners, like on the trend side, rebalancing the bonds. It's like, you know, t that sucks the air right out of the room, you know, because all the financial media is telling us the worst market ever. And it's like, look, bonds are going to come back. Do I know if it's next month, next quarter, next year, 10 years from now? I don't know. But I like scale trading these equity curves. And if we're in one of the deepest drawdown for bonds, it may be a decent time to be scaling into that position. I don't know. That's the point of the portfolios we construct. But with rebalancing, that's our trading strategy of, of scaling in on the way down and scaling out on the way up. Jack? Yeah, uh, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so, Corey, did, did I just hear Corey Hofstein call the bottom in bonds? <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Um, let's see what question. Okay, here's this question. Does the VIX have to spike in order, or does the VIX have to top for the S and P five hundred to bottom? Corey, I'll jump on this. I'll jump on this grenade too. I just got lucky on this one because uh, Russell Rhodes. Shout out to Russell Rhodes. Used to be at SIBO for like a decade. Now he's like head of research for EQD. And one of the random stats that he pulled up, and I just want to get it exactly right. So I'll actually go back to my notes on this one. Is like. We've never had a rebound from a bear market without VIX being above 45. So there's two pieces yeah. of that. W one is Corey and I uh, hate historical analogs that like it's never happened before because you know then it tends to happen because that's the pain trade. But that was an interesting piece. But also Russell was asking at the same time, have the volatility markets changed now that we moved you know from quarterlies to monthlies to weeklies now daily options is like is that kind of smoothing out vol across the surface? Um, so maybe vol might react differently, but I thought that was an interesting, uh, quote or statistic that we never had a rebound from a bear market without VIX going above 45 first. And so the pe other people on his panel, um, shout out to like Stacey Gilbert was talking about, yeah, that's why we've had this organized sell off without VIX spiking. And so she thinks there's like a second leg down, whether it's, you know, two months from now or 18 months from now, where then VIX does spike above 45 before we can rebound. And I'll throw a monkey wrench in there with VIX being about 45. The other question is, historically, if you're a commodity person as well, is can the market rebound unless oil sells off? Okay. I'm going to get overly technical here, Jason. Okay, this great. Is, it's, it's amazing where our minds go with this sort of stuff. So here's, yeah. here, I went to, what is the VIX, right? The VIX is supposed to be, uh, an estimate of the strike of a one month variant swap, which I know I just said a whole bunch of stuff that maybe to people tuning in means nothing. But right, if you don't, if you like, you shouldn't be talking about the VIX really without understanding what the VIX is. And and the VIX is exactly what I said. It's the, it's the strike of and a one month variant swap based upon option replication. So it goes and it looks at options of the S and P five hundred index. And there's a way in which you can replicate how a variant swap behaves using options. And it uses that to back out what the fair value strike is of that variant swap. And that would sort of be the market clearing price if you were to say, hey, I'll, I'll take a fixed amount of variance and sell you uh, however much variance is actually realized in the market. Why to say that, that simply really quick, yeah, to say that simply really quick, though, like, once again, it's not volatility, it's variance, and it's just the market's expectation 30 days forward where variance is going to be to the upside or downside. That's why it's not necessarily fear. It's a it's a forward-looking estimate of variance of the S&P 500 expressed through options. Right. That might have made it hard, like, trying to simplify <laughs> So, well, so, so why is that important? Because I was thinking yeah. about why does the VIX necessarily go up in a market? crash. Well, what we've seen since 1987 is options volatility. When you look at the surface, there's a skew, right? And, and typically puts or bid more than calls are. And so if you assume a, God, Jack is going to hate me for saying all these technical terms, but if you assume a, a, a fixed strike vol surface, 
as the market moves down, the at the money implied vol is higher and higher. And VIX is based upon uh, the option implied volatilities around the at the money price. And so you should see a natural increase in VIX simply based upon the skew that's baked into the options that are being used to derive VIX. So all of that is to say in a very sort of like jumbled technical way, uh, yeah, based upon normal market dynamics, you should have a, you know, market down VIX up and market up VIX down behavior. Like, and that doesn't mean people are buying puts or, 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 or buying, you know, protection or selling protection. Like that's just what's already baked in to expectations. It's then changes above or below that, that are sort of people's repositioning. So to Jack's question, do we need to see a VIX spike for the S&P to bottom? I don't think you need to see a spike, but I think there's a very structural reason based upon what we normally see in terms of how option implied volatility surfaces work, why you see VIX go up when the S&P goes down. It's just sort of baked into the process. Yeah, it's like stairs up, elevator down. But like you said, to ask answer Jack's specific question, do we need to have, is it like, uh, is it a certainty that you need a big spike for the S&P 500 bottom? No, because like what we've seen over the last five months is the same thing we saw in December of 18 is you can have the forward looking variants have an expected move of 1% a day and the market can grind down a half a percent a day for days on end and you're not going to see any sort of spike in VIX. And then vice versa, you could see the same thing climbing back out of that bottom. So if you had an organized sell off and an organized recovery, you would not see a spike in in VIX due to be, there, there's not a there's not a spike in variance. But also there's also an interesting question actually in the comments about this too. Why are all asset classes correlated when the VIX is high from Brian? And that's that elevator down and almost that S&P 500 is like the largest, most liquid market in the world. So when you have a VAR shock or liquidity cascade, is you're going to see VIX spiking because S&P 500 is having a larger variance than expected because everybody's looking for liquidity and they're selling off all their asset classes because correlations go to one. Everybody's going to cash or the most liquid in the S&P 500. And so that's where you see that that correlations go to one when you have VAR shocks is because you know everyone wants to see who actually has cash available versus who was uh, had had pretend assets. And that's why it's represented through S&P 500 and VIX because that's the most liquid market in the world. Corey, right. hot takes on that or is Jack's that's turn right. again? No, Corey. I, mean, I think Jack we lost Corey to the comments. I, I, yeah, I was, really, but, it, but I just want to click. I mean, Jack, what I said, I felt like wasn't maybe the most coherent, cohesive sentences. So <laughs> you be the judge is what I said clear or, or was it total gibberish clear as I'm mud. I'm biased clear as mud. I'm biased because I don't know a lot about commodity trading advisors CTA so I'm very confused when you guys talk about that but I have listened to like more podcasts and maybe more people about what you're talking about so it made more sense to me but just sort of uh, neutralizing that out it, it could I think it definitely could be a little bit confusing so you're saying that the narrative that the reason the VIX goes higher when the S&P crashes or goes down is because people are buying protection is incomplete. That actually, once the S&P 500 goes from here to here, the uh, moneyness or whatever that is being calculated is a higher is itself a higher level of volatility. Yeah. So let's let's use like a really simple example. Like let's say the S&P is at a hundred dollars today, and and the implied volatility for that at the money option, so that's struck at $100, is 20%. I'm just making these numbers up. And then let's say we look at, I don't know, a, a one-month 20% out of the money put. So struck at $80. The, let, and let's say the implied volatility there is 40%. Well, if the market then sells off 20%, we are saying we're expecting implied vol to go from 20 to 40 that was already baked into the market expectation, right? And so when that happens, it's not that like VIX went up because people are panicking. That's just what was priced into the market in those options already, even before the sell-off happened. You'd have to see an increase above 40% to say that people are bidding protection at that point. 
And, and right. what Corey's saying, that's the difference between fixed strike ball and floating strike. And you you pay for fixed strike ball, and that's what affects your PL. And then the floating strike is what you see in the VIX. So even though you would see a move in the VIX that looked like a spike from 20 to 40, you actually buying protection didn't do well. And that's what we're saying is almost the trader trope is like a hedge market doesn't crash. And it's fixed strike ball is the price you pay. Going back to our, our, our initial question with collectibles and Rolex, if I've already overpaid for my Rolex, and inflation continues in the next year, I might actually lose money on my inflation hedge with Rolex because it's about the price you pay. So if I'm if I'm overpaying because skew is high and we have a very hedged market, you're not going to see a lot of movement there. Yeah, it's like the conversation we had last time about, right, when you're buying insurance, you're paying both for your house yeah. burning down at the time, how much damage is done versus the perception of how much risk there is of the house burning down, right? When the perception is high, right? It's already baked into the price of the contract. Your premium is high. Well, in options, premium and implied volatility are pretty much one in the same. And so when you have this skew where out of the money puts are naturally priced at a premium because people value that protection, what you will see is as the market starts to sell off and we go from, oh, this is a potential to this is a reality, you will price that insurance at the money insurance will move up to where it was priced originally when it was just a potential occurrence. Now, now that now that risk has been realized, and then what you need to see is people saying, ooh, I think there's an even higher risk, not it's the same risk as we thought before. So that's or just one way of saying when risk is realized, we should see the VIX go up. And in fact, you can sometimes see the opposite. You can see the VIX go up, but go up less than what was expected because that realized event happened and people are going, yeah, you want to, yeah, part of the house burned down, but this was a pretty mild fire. The rest of the house isn't going to burn down. Not as bad as we expected. And your, your insurance can actually pay off less than you wanted it to. And how would you know that, that it didn't realize as much as was priced in? <laughs> well, I mean, the, the simple way to, to do it is look at Skew what flattens, the, fixed strike yeah. ball comes in, even though VIX is up. Yeah, what what you so your PL your PL tells you <laughs> is like yeah. what was your at the money volatility? So the way I'd look at it is, you know, based on when you bought the protection, what was the at the money volatility? What was the out of the money volatility of the protection you bought? And where did once you go sort of through the through the strike, what was the at the money volatility when that event was realized? And you will get a sense of, you know, that difference of the first two is the perception of risk. And then the second uh, tells you about how much risk was actually realized. Okay, I think if, if I replay this video and listen again to what you said, I think I might. This would be better with uh, a picture. Uh, yeah. And my pen that I have on me is actually out of ink. So. Okay, let's move on to another picture, or as some some people call these pictures charts. It's something I got from your Twitter, Corey, and it's one I think it's best if you explain it. And then also, I know you had a follow up follow-up question about it about like price to earnings ratio and such so i'm just gonna uh he just yeah he, he ah. had to leave to be able to show the chart so you have to explain the chart and like what you said around it and a baby basically a follow-up question okay oh, Jack's back. Back. He's like, okay technical so do, you, do you want me to explain the chart yeah it's i mean it's just like does this what do you think what do you think that this shows it shows that yeah so okay yeah. I, can, I can tell you so this is from a jp morgan note um, and what you have on the left side is forward price to earnings ratios of the largest 10 stocks in the market. And that's in orange. So forward PE basically saying what's the current price divided by forward estimates of earnings. And what you can see there is that obviously the dot-com bubble stands out. And on the right side, you can see that valuations of the largest 10 stocks got pretty elevated to near towards historic highs and have since pulled back quite a bit. The blue line is the rest of the S&P. So call it the, the 490, even though I don't think there's exactly 500 stocks today. Right half says, what if we look at the top 25 stocks? Is this just a top 10 stock phenomenon? And then versus the rest of the S&P, you can see it wasn't just a top 10 stock phenomenon. Uh, obviously the top 25 seem to get expensive as well. And what some people are saying is that while your mega caps are not cheap, they are significantly cheaper today, obviously, than they were a year ago. The big question I brought up was, 
well, how accurate is that estimate of earnings, right? Because if these estimates of earnings are too high, even though they're actually just, I think they just got revised up another 3%. If they're too high, then these PEs that seem like they're lower are actually much higher. And so what I actually was able to get some data on was saying, well, look, let's look at forward PEs versus the realized trailing 12 month PEs that came after. And what you see as expected is in a recession, you, you basically see those earnings have to get revised way down, that the realized PEs end up looking a lot more expensive than the forward PEs looked at the beginning of the recession because earnings estimates were too high. So that was just my way of saying, you look at this and you might say, oh, this is actually maybe a, a buying point, especially when you start talking about small caps, which have come off dramatically, but it's not a buying point if those earning estimates are off dramatically. So are you saying that forward-looking earning estimates can be poor if we go into a recession? Uh, by the way, Guillermo's in the chat. Shout out to Guillermo, <laughs> nice, uh, who's nice been tweeting about this nonstop. I yeah, definitely, right. New River Invest, go check him out on Twitter. He's got some great graphs on this. Uh, yes, Guillermo, you have been tweeting about this nonstop. I was trying to get a sense. He, I believe... And then he can only chat. He can't talk. He, his graphs were using a mixture of different valuation models, I believe, both forward-looking and trailing. But yeah, Jason, I'm just basically saying that if we enter a recession and these forward earnings are revised down, then these numbers are total garbage. It's a garbage in, garbage out exercise. And I was just trying to I get wasn't a sense trying to be snarky. No, but I, what I was trying to look at in the tweets I, I sent out this afternoon actually got the data and said, well, how far off can that really be? And it can be dramatically far off. No, I was just trying to understand what you were saying. I just want to make sure I was correct on that. But like, as you know, around here, I, I hate DCFs. I hate forward-looking earnings and forward guidance, all of that stuff, because we're talking Whoa. about the future. Whoa. Yeah. Had to throw that forward one guidance. in there too, Jack. Yeah, all right. It's forward guidance. You heard it here, folks. Anything right. forward. Anything <laughs> mo like with crystal ball involved, uh, you know, subconsciously involved in the uh, the... The, the quote, then, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm always uh, dubious to say the least. So I will well, say so this me, about go ahead, Corey. No, I was just going to say, I, I agree with you because there's so much noise. But when you start to see these measures hit extremes, like the 99.9th percentile readings or the 0.1 percentile reading on a historical basis, the probability of it from being from noise starts to collapse towards zero and you start to say okay this this is probably signal so when i look at a lot of this stuff right it's it's less interesting today to say this is a buying opportunity because there's a lot of potential noise here um mm -hmm. or or but you know was it a selling opportunity six months ago much more likely because we were near those percentile extremes so that was, as you know, my next question is always going to be the most important question is like, what do we do about it? Right. And so what you just said, though, is like, if we could retroactively go in and sell well, <laughs> six months ago or like, 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 are you just saying it's not a buying opportunity? It's not like an outright buy opportunity. Is yeah, that I wouldn't say, say it's an outright buy opportunity, but there are certain cohorts you can look at. Right. This is just looking at the largest. These are the mega caps in orange and then mm -hmm. the rest of the market. The rest of the market doesn't look like, you know, 2008 cheap. It doesn't look like 2013 cheap. Um, it's still relatively expensive on a historical basis. But if you go look at certain cohorts of small to mid cap stocks, that's not necessarily true. Some of them do look very, very cheap. And for them to get cheaper, you really have to ask some interesting questions about how much earnings destruction has to be done or what has to happen to interest rates. One of the, the fun things I like to do is I use the, the dividend discount model that sort of future dividend over growth rate, or what is it? Uh, sorry, over over uh, rate of return minus the growth rate. And I basically say, knowing the forward dividend, holding that constant, can I sort of use current rates and back out growth implications today versus yesterday? And how much have growth implications changed versus six months ago if I know that those forward dividends haven't changed much? And you can find some cases where what the market is pricing in is a really dramatic recession that maybe doesn't necessarily make sense. So all of it's garbage, Jason, like, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying discounted cash flow is accurate, 
But when you get to really extreme readings, yeah, either uh, among relative cohorts or just the absolute market, I think that's where you can start to say a lot of that garbage in, garbage out noise sort of you can be swept under the rug a little. Right. And I, in this, I had two questions about this. One is as quant Corey, right? When you get to those 99th percentile readings, like that gives you some information, but then as real world Corey of actually having run investment firms for over a decade, that, that could, it could stay irrational longer and you could stay solvent. So that's what I'm saying. It's like, what do we do about it? Yeah. I mean, but look, then, value, so value overwhelms trend eventually, but not while liquidity <laughs> is driving the boat. Right. Right. When and liquidity so part is the... abundant, value kind of stops mattering. And when liquidity dries up, value stops mattering. So in this sense, right, if we think they're going to go into an environment where liquidity everywhere disappears, I'm not trying to catch a falling knife necessarily. Yeah. And that, so part of the this is a semi-related question, but I was curious your take on this because uh, during the EQD conference, I think it was John Black who's, who was in charge of uh, derivatives on NASDAQ. So obviously speaking his book, but it was interesting. He was pointing out that like, you know, six of the top 10, you know, stocks, especially on the NASDAQ, you're using largest 10 here, uh, are, are also on the S&P 500, you know, and so, you know, we always talk about hedging, you know, do you want to hedge directly your S&P 500 beta exposure or do you want to take a little basis risk? So then the question would be, is on, on like the vol Q side, if you start hedging with puts on the NASDAQ or, or use vol Q instead of VIX, like, is there... Um, is that a much more interesting trade, assuming the price you pay is cheaper? But are you taking basis risk, or is now is there less basis risk historically uh, between Nasdaq and S and P? Well, I think the way I would answer that is if you're going to take basis risk, and just to clarify, what is basis risk? Well, if I yeah. own the S and P 500 and I buy puts on the S and P 500, that's an exact hedge. If I buy the S and P 500 and I buy puts on the Nasdaq, it's entirely possible. The S&P 500 goes down 10% and the NASDAQ doesn't, right? You can see a, a, um, a dispersion between those returns. So it's not a perfect hedge. And that difference is called basis risk. My view is that you should really only take basis risk when it's justified by the amount of convexity you can get. So if put protection in the S&P is incredibly expensive, but put protection in the NASDAQ is really cheap and you can get you know, five times the amount of convexity, right? Like your payoff could be 5X what you could get in, in the S&P, then yeah, that basis risk might be worth it because the payoff is so much more so that even if it goes down a little, you're sort of getting the same amount of hedge. I think that's where you really need to think of the trade-off in terms of like relative to the extra protection you get. Today, I don't think that's the case at all. Um, no, now, the pricing, I think the point, well, the pricing though, is not like, there. Yeah. yeah, the pricing's not there, but to your question, given that there's such big overlap, have they become more correlated? Uh, I would probably assume so, right? But I would also say that's going to get priced into the options in an efficient market anyway, so... That's fair, but uh, okay. Well, depending on flows, right? That's what we always got to overlay that on top. But like to extend that question a little bit, because it comes back to our correlation question from earlier, is another way to say basis. You could also say a proxy is correlation. And so, like you're saying, if you can get that in a much more convex payout from Nasdaq puts than you could get from S and P puts, uh, and then but you know you're taking correlation or basis risk. Is there a way to quantify that, or is that the art versus the science? Oh, there's definitely going to be a lot of art there. Right. I just wonder because, if you add like a science for it. Like, is there is there any way to really quantify that? No, I don't think there's a way to quantify it because it's not even correlation, right? Yeah, you, they could be perfectly correlated. The S and P can go down fifteen, and the Nasdaq could go down two. It's just that they right. zigged and zagged at the exact same time, right? So that that's sort of the core problem is there's a magnitude problem as as well as a directional problem, and both of them need to be solved for to overcome that basis risk. And the more the market believes that there's no basis risk, the, the less sort of differentiation you're going to get in pricing. So to get cheap convexity taking basis risk, the market is basically telling you it's not going to be a good hedge. Corey, EMH Hofstein. Uh, Jack, go for it. <laughs> uh, so I, I guess just because now we're looking at the chart, I'd, I'd wonder... Corey, historically, have there been as many structurally unprofitable companies in, in the U.S. that have gone public? Because to me, 
I'm still I still see a lot of companies that okay it's gone from a hundred dollars to thirty dollars, but like the their margins are you know negative eighty percent. Like what what's going on here, you know? And so I don't know, but like it, has there been a prior time? I, I figure probably in the dot com bubble there were types of companies like that, but were they as big as they are now? Like you know, I, I could see a situation where you're absolutely right. Like, yeah, now is a great time to just, uh, you know, go into Apple, you know, or whatever on, on Google, the, the fangs. But there's, there seems a lot of, to me, like a lot of companies that remain poor investments even at this time. Yeah, I don't I don't have numbers on this. I would presume it was actually worse in the dot-com era, though. Not as a percentage of overall market? Yeah. Yeah, I think it was worse in the dot-com era. But part of that was because more companies went public than you're seeing today. I think you have a huge number of private companies that would have gone public 20 years ago that are delaying going public. And you're going to see, and you're already seeing it in some VC indices, they're just going to collapse because these were companies that were paying more to acquire customers and trying to, you know, then they earn from customers and trying to make it up at scale, which is math that doesn't work under any circumstance. So yeah, I think, uh, in the market as a whole, I don't. I, I would just speculate. No, I think the dot com era was worse. But if you include private, I'm not sure that's necessarily true. We just went through a sort of golden age of shitty startups, which you know, good stuff came out of. But it became in vogue to start something up. And I think a lot of these are non profitable startups that could only survive when money was cheap and liquidity was flowing. And if we exit that era a lot of them are going to starve. Mm -hmm. And yeah. to Corey's point, our, our, oh, our mutual friend Ben Eifert was saying too, there's a reflexivity he sees that he's going to be curious when private actually does start actually marking down on their models, how that flows through to publicly traded companies, which then th flows through through volatility. Right. I Yeah, Corey, I think you're, what you said that so there's so many companies that haven't gone public, that was extremely true maybe four years ago but I, I think in the past two years you have seen the ipo machine churning again the spac yeah, the machine SPAC has been machine. churning again um yeah i mean i was just looking like the spac machine it's now kind of on ice uh but i, I one of the mo companies that went public a few months ago i won't say the name but i was just looking at it today and yeah they make like 10 million dollars in revenue a quarter and they lose 50 million dollars you know so it's just like you know, they, and they're still in their in their decks. They're still talking about growth and scale and Moore's law. And I'm just like, they don't get it. You know, that's they're two years too late. Yeah, and that and that may be it. The timing might just be wrong, and it's all going to depend on the liquidity that continues to exist in the system. And if things tighten dramatically, I think you could see a lot of these companies not be able to get the funding they need or do the secondary issuance. There just won't be appetite for it, and they'll they'll run out of money. Yeah. Uh, Rajiv Gupta in the comments says Clover Health. That's a great example. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's really hard to actually find a SPAC that is not, a company that has was a SPAC, de spac that is trading higher than $10. Um, I mean, they definitely exist, but they are rare. I want to actually put up a few comments uh, I thought I think are funny. Uh, we see this one. Should start a new derivatives market called Pasts. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, Medicham always has great comments. Yeah, man, has got great comments. And then Tyler, you got a you got a really good. Not only was it a compliment to me, but it was pretty funny. Oh, my this hot, is self, the stuff my, aggrandizing. My hot and real yeah. girlfriend is in the other room. <laughs> very real, hot and like very that. real. Uh, by the way, Tyler, shout out to Tyler, man. Like, if anybody doesn't follow him, he does these like amazing like bullet point re like uh, reviews of podcasts. And so, like, if you're figuring out what podcast you want to listen to and everything. He does some great stuff on Twitter for like giving you like the kind of synopsis and bullet points to see if like this is a podcast you'd be interested in. So I appreciate it for one. So I just wanted to give Tyler a shout out. Appreciate it. Hey, uh, Jason, that's really nice of you because all three of us have podcasts and Jason and Corey, what were you guys doing earlier today? Because I was recording a podcast about two hours ago. What First of all, who doesn't have a podcast? It's 2022. <laughs> it's not special anymore. <laughs> No, Jack, it's more like how many podcasts do we have? Yeah. It's not just yeah, yeah, podcasting true. all the time. It's like, yeah, it's like now you work on two, three shows at the same, and especially we do weekly. Uh, we all have two, know. right? We have, we, I have, yeah, I have four guidance. Uh, um, Corey, you got flirted with models. Yeah, the difference is, though, I do mine seasonally. So my season starts mm. on Monday. 
and it's going to go for three months. So I've been spending the last two and a half months recording all the episodes so that I don't have to do anything for another nine months or 12 months, mm-hmm. I guess. I'm a glutton for punishment. I started moving to a weekly cadence for our mutiny investing podcast. And it's a nightmare booking guests and doing it on a weekly you just basis. Just do it my way, buddy. You guys know how many I, I do, right? Not including this. I do three a week. Yeah, but this is your job. This is our yeah, that's side. True. Like- that's true. That's true. Yeah, yeah. All but right, I, I invest on the side. That's not my job. I'm shorting. I'm, I'm buying. Not a doctor, but I play. I stayed yeah. in a Holiday Inn Express last night. Yeah, there we go, uh, <laughs> guys. I don't have. I don't have any any more questions left. Do you? Do you have any for me? <laughs> yeah, we'll start. No, we don't have one for you. But I'm, I'm going to just pull from the comments. Rajiv asks, "Are podcasts correlated to equities?" That's a great question. Seeing that we're talking about correlation these days, the proliferation of SPACs, and we should we should get like Vincent Delaware to do a good correlation matrix between. Uh, amount of podcasts and like maybe SPACs or something like because you've ever seen Vincent's sorry go Vincent's ahead, fantastic no no I this, actually he has, he has a go ahead Vin, Vincent has a great one that I and people need to bring to light more it's the amount of feces on the street and feces and needles on the street of San Francisco combined with uh employee stock option plans at, at Bay Area startups that's just a fantastic yeah and part of the first, your first reaction is oh that's correlation not causation but then you think about it, you're like you know what there's something there but Corey, I mean, go Jason, ahead. you you know that months and months ago when the meme mania was going more crazy, I was doing sentiment analysis of YouTube videos, yeah. right? Um, I haven't I haven't looked in a while, it, but I would be very curious if you looked at the main financial channels that got really popular over the last two years, and you looked at their views, how how those have changed. I certainly can just say a lot of the discords that I sort of lurk in uh, in the crypto space are dead. Like one comment a day dead. Whereas in the heat of it last year, it was hundreds and thousands of comments a day. So what I kind think of disc- which, which, pure- which discords like just the crypto ones or SPACs or everything? Yeah, these are, these are mostly crypto ones. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah I mean, I tracked Wall Street bets pretty closely and yeah, the activity there is definitely waning. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I just feel like so much crap has been foisted on the retail investor. And there was a time when it was performing extremely well. And the people who were fo- selling the crap, you know, their reputations were going up. But I just feel like... All right. Uh, you're talking about Shamath. <laughs> no, no, no. Which I, which never, I get. I never... First of all, uh, I don't think crypto was hoisted upon the retail investor. No, yeah, I don't I don't think so. I wasn't really talking about crypto, but yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of other but, but I wonder, also like GMC, GMC, GME and AMC. Like those were not hoisted upon retail investors. There is a true. lot of stuff that retail investors I don't want to say brought upon themselves, but I think a lot of lessons were potentially learned. Arc maybe is a different example. Well, I, I wonder, though, in a different sense, is like you're saying about like we we're talking about the collect- collectibles and Rolexes earlier is like how much is there always like these strong undercurrents, right? Like and so it was like the stay at home craze. Obviously, we started buying more shit that we could d- get delivered to our house. So all of a sudden collectibles rise in asset classes. And now that everybody's going out again, like I said, like airfares through the roof. Vegas was crazy again. You know, like everybody shifts that way. So everybody thinks that like. Once again, correlations are spurious. And so the, I would always be concerned about that. Like I always think about uh, when my girlfriend used to run like a wine program, right? And every year her bonus would be on wine sales. And I'm like, she has no ability to affect that. I mean, on, on an individual table, she can, you know, upsell a wine, but it's the global economy that matters a lot more to if their wine sales are increasing at the market. Yet we always think because of our psychological immune systems that we're actually doing anything and correlations matter when you have these undercurrents where like rising tide lifts all boats or escapes about out the other side too. So you go, well, crypto's correlated in the last two years or whatever. It's like how much of it's like stay at home being on discord to now like you can get outside and travel more. Like, I, I don't know. Jason, you're definitely one of those people that doesn't believe in free will. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to pretend I do though. Right? Like that's, that's the rub. This is the rub. You can you can know that free will doesn't Perfect. exist, but the thing you're using to say that is the thing that believes in free will, so that way you could take a shit in the toilet in the morning. <laughs> and with that, I feel like that's a perfect place then. Yeah, that's I don't want to go I don't want to say anything else. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been the Pirates of Finance <laughs> podcast show. We're here on Blockworks. Uh, you've got oh, pointing the wrong way. That's Jack Farley up there running things behind the scenes. Jack, you think 
Thank you. For <laughs> Jack, thanks for the questions today. You can find him on Twitter at Jack Farley 96. The man right there. Don't you dare switch it, Jack. That's my good friend and partner in crime. Jason Buck. You can find him at Jason Mutiny. I'm Corey Hofstein at C Hofstein. Don't forget to subscribe, like, leave us some comments. We do read them. We don't respond to them, nor do we care for them, but we do read them. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I do read them. Wait, okay, we got we, you ended it so well. I just, but I ruined it. We don't want to have we we don't want to say anything about the thirty to fifty percent growth GDP. What just is stop, to Jack. Say? We okay, just, we, yeah, we had okay, an ending. Okay. We had an, I I fucked things up, you know. So yeah, all right. Thanks so much, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Have a great week.